Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, and thank everyone for coming. Um, just, yeah, it's, it's great to see all the excitement around, around this area. So um, unfortunately, maybe um, compared to what people may be expecting, um, I'm not going to talk about why deep learning is great in a lot of details. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about applications. Um, I'm, hopefully, I'm, I'm hopeful that people have maybe heard a little bit of enough of that. Um, and I'd like to spend a lot of the time during this talk uh, focusing on a clear opportunity for improving the performance of deep learning. Um, I'm also hoping to convince you that performance actually matters for these workloads and computers aren't even close to being fast enough. Um, this is going to be a pretty technical talk. Um, I'm going to focus on a lot of open research areas here where I don't think anybody knows the answer to, to these questions. So I'm going to pose some questions um, as we go along here and I'm hoping that some of the work that people are doing here um, can help make progress on some of these problems. Um, I'm going to try to convince you that if we do make progress, um, the result will be worth it. Okay, so let's, I'm going to start by briefly summarizing the success in deep learning um, this year. Um, and I'm going to focus on two results. So the first result, um, I guess it's on, on, your, uh, on your left, is the um, progress made in image recognition. So this is plotting um, accuracy on uh, the ImageNet benchmark challenge um, over, year, over years. Um, so in 2011, we would think of as the uh, first time that deep learning um, algorithms were really applied to this problem. And you can just see this very steady um, improvement in performance over time um, after that point. Um, the, other, um, the other technology that I'd like to focus on is uh, speech recognition. Um, this is work that we did at Baidu Research. Uh, this is shown on um, on, on the other side of the figure, um, we're looking at a single deep recurrent neural network um, that's performing a task of speech recognition. So it's converting from um, audio data into a textual representation. Um, there's there are very few other components in the system other than the deep neural network. Um, I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, but in two languages with the same algorithm, so in English and in Mandarin, we're able to approach human level performance, where human level performance is measured by querying or tasking a number of humans um, to listen to audio and write down what they think the answer is, um, having them even debate you know, with a small group of people um, to form a consensus, um, and comparing the result of that against the result of the system. Um, we actually match performance in, in Mandarin in many situations. Um, and it's Right, so the idea here is that um, these are really examples. Um, people may think that deep learning really applies well to vision problems, and it may be hard to think of problems outside of vision um, as being accessible to deep learning. Um, I think that the deep speech work is actually important um, because it shows that deep learning can be applied to other problem domains as well. Um, so we are applying it here to speech recognition. Um, there have been recent successes also in natural language processing um, and reinforcement learning. Um, so the uh, recent result that people may have, may have heard of is the, um, uh, a single um, or, a deep or a deep neural network uh, playing the game of Go and beating the world champion. Um, this is work done by Google's DeepMind group. Um, and so they're just examples of deep learning um, starting out in vision and being applied successfully to other domains as well. Um, so we see this trend continuing into the future. Um, and let's, so, so there's one maybe main reason why, why this is being driven forward. There's one main cause um, that's actually creating this opportunity. So I'm gonna focus on that a little bit. Um, I'm gonna focus on it by examining the um, Deep Speech 2 system in a little bit more detail. So um, this figure really tries to show uh, how the algorithm works in terms of the basic building blocks. So on one side we have an input audio waveform. In the middle we have a deep convolutional recurrent neural network. Um, we have a CTC cost function. This is just a minor detail. Just think of this as an error function that's grading the network in terms of how good the prediction is compared to a reference. Um, these are trained in supervised learning settings. So we have a large data set, a lot of audio clips, we have a lot of reference labels, um, and we're making small updates to the network to try to match, um, match the reference labels. So one thing that's really important to realize here 
is if you look at the network architectures between um, the algorithm that's used for English recognition and the algorithm that's used for Mandarin recognition, the only thing that changes is the output character set. So in the first case, we're outputting English characters. Um, the second case, we're outputting uh, Mandarin characters directly. There's a much larger set of characters in Chinese. It's more, um, not more like 30, it's more like uh, 5,000, 10,000, um, 50,000 if you, if you want to include absolutely everything, but most people usually don't use the complete set. Um, so with basically the same algorithm, it's a very minor change to think about, just changing the output set. Um, we can approach human level accuracy with the same algorithm. But there's a wrinkle here. Um, these networks are extremely expensive to train. So one rule of thumb that we have is basically, right, so one rule of thumb that we have is we're going to train these systems on the biggest, fastest computer that we have, and we're going to do it, you know, not for any, any specific amount of time, we're going to do it up to the point where we're, you know, we get bored or we get impatient. Um, and this is usually about two, two weeks to about a month. And after that, if your experiment starts taking maybe a year, two years, um, you start wondering, you know, is there something better that I can do with my time? Um, so the 20 exaflops of work kind of translates into about um, two weeks or about a month um, on a very high-end, uh, high-throughput optimized system. So let's look at that. All right, so that, that kind of is getting towards this motivation where we just need, we need faster or we need more performance. Um, I want to look at that just in one more detail here. This is the absolute most important result for deep learning. This is why deep learning works. Um, so, you know, c perhaps in the past you may have seen a graph like this um, that's actually kind of a cartoon graph that's just trying to show a relationship where on one axis we have the data set size, and on the other axis we either have an accuracy or an error rate um, on, a per, on a problem. So this is looking um, at the deep speech uh, model in this example. This is a real graph. This is real data. So we see a power law relationship between the data set size and the accuracy. Right? This is the reason why we care about compute. Large internet companies basically have infinite data. 10,000 hours of data is super tiny. It is, it is minuscule compared to the scale of data that's available on the internet. It's also, you also may wonder, well, maybe that's true for unlabeled data, but what about labeled data? Isn't it really expensive to get labeled data? This is just a money problem. It's not actually very expensive in an absolute sense in, compared to the scale of computer that you would have to run this on, especially um, to gather a data set of this size. The reason why this graph doesn't keep extending to the right is because we don't know how to map these algorithms onto even bigger computers. So this is the promise of deep learning. Does this hold up on other application domains? And does this graph continue off to the right with larger data sets? So we hope it does. <laughs> We also believe that there's an opportunity to pr improve performance. Um, deep learning has been one, maybe one of the first drivers, major drivers of using uh, high performance processors like GPUs, high throughput processors like GPUs um, to accelerate model training or to accelerate this workload. Um, it took a lot of work actually to port these algorithms onto GPUs. Um, GPUs are notoriously hard to program. There's a lot of parallelism. It's really, there's a lot of complexity. There's a lot of latency. It's hard to get good throughput out of them for many algorithms. This is not an easy problem at all. Deep learning is relatively easy from that perspective. It's very regular. It's very much aligned with traditional HPC workloads like big, dense linear algebra problems. Um, and so the state of the art right now is running deep learning training algorithms on one or a few GPUs. But there's a huge gap between one and a few GPUs or a few GPUs and the biggest supercomputer that we could think of building. Um, so this graph tries to show um, a Titan X GPU, which is a relatively high-end GPU from NVIDIA um, as a green data point here. And the gap between that uh, single GPU and the largest publicly available or publicly released um, supercomputer in the world is about 10,000 times. So there's a huge opportunity to push the performance of um, deep learning training forward 
um, and to take advantage of larger data sets, hopefully unlocking even better accuracy, even better or even lower error rates on hard problems in artificial intelligence, like speech recognition, vision, decision making, natural language. OK. There's a, go ahead. It's 10,000 gaps because it's not feasible to build a supercomputer with that many GPUs in it? No, not at all. This, you know, the, this, the points up here have 10,000, 20,000 GPUs in them or other high performance processors. Um, I'd also like to point out that um, the top 500 supercomputer list is the publicly available list that this data is based off of. Um, there are definitely faster computers than this in the world. This is the public list. <laughs> um, there's at least, I, I would guess, there's maybe one or two more errors of magnitude in here. OK. So I tried to um, draw a little cartoon uh, that describes what model training looks like. So you know, we have this huge opportunity to improve performance. Um, we have this workload we'd really like to accelerate. Um, the first step is probably developing a better understanding of that workload. So this is a cartoon representation that tries to uh, capture the major components of deep learning model training. Um, so at the top, we have a training data set. The size of these data sets varies by application. Um, usually, because we're compute limited, this isn't as big of a data set as you might find in other domains. This isn't 10, per 10 petabytes of data. This is maybe a couple terabytes of data. Um, it depends on the representation. So images would be different than speech, would be different than language. Um, it kind of goes in the order of language is the most compressed, um, speech is the next most compressed, and images are the least compressed. So you just mentioned 10 petabytes, and you also mentioned the number of exabytes as well, too. Um, you also mentioned you're at about 10,000 conversations, I guess, or? Oh, OK, over here? Of, so, so this is hours of audio. Oh, it's like, OK, hours of audio. So the, the question is, you know, in order to solve some of these problems, how much storage do you need to correspond to the number of petabytes? Does it correspond to Andal's other law, as it is other, otherwise known? Um, so just in terms of some concrete numbers, I think 10,000 hours of audio here is in the range of 1 to 10 terabyte. Um, again, it depends on the application. Um, usually, so you see this um, power law relationship, right? So you would need, so the way to think about this perhaps in the context of speech is if we went from 10 terabytes to 100 terabytes, we'd get something like a 30 or 40 percent reduction in error rate. So you do need a larger and larger data set to get um, to get better performance. I'm just trying. I'm just trying to. So, so you're you're telling me that you have a, a sort of in, a slight imbalance between the need for cycles to the amount of storage. You, you really need more cycles to storage. That's, yes, especially compared to other applications. Yeah, that's sort of Thatcher's definition of what constitutes a supercomputer. Where it turns out a compute bound problem to an I.O. bound problem. If you heard that sort of so Right. I, so I, I don't think we're there. I don't think I don't think this workload is is actually becoming I.O. bound. Um, I'll, I'll cover that a little bit in more yeah, detail. There, there's some subtleties here. That you need you need to do, including temporary storage, in order to in order to analyze the amount of audio you have there. I mean, you, what if you take ten thousand hours? Multiply that obviously by a, some sampling rate to get some some amount of storage, and you're talking about terabytes. But that's like six orders of magnitude to exabytes. Yeah, you, right. You, you so completely we, jumped over the peta in between. Oh, sorry. When I when I mentioned um, exa here, yeah. I meant I meant flops, not bytes. Yeah, but my my, my point is, Am Amdahl made this quote. Other law, he, he basically said, for every MIP. You tend to need a megabyte, and you need a megabyte per second. This little sort of triangle. It's it's in this paper. I mean, it's only three pages long. Sure. Deep so learning guys blew that out of the water. Yeah, that's sure. what I'm trying to. That's what I'm trying to figure out. over these stupid these things repeatedly. You just yeah. Can't yeah. Now. Yeah. yeah, they invented they, they invented an algorithm that blows that out of the water. Yeah, that's, that's okay. So you you don't have a sense of how much storage you're actually going to need for this 20 exa exaflops. 
It's much less. It's much less. It's yeah. a different kind of relationship. Instead of lightweight compute and very heavyweight storage, you have an inverse relationship. You have very heavyweight compute, very lightweight storage capacity requirements. Right. It's, it's something that's fundamentally different about these workloads. Um, the access pattern is also a little bit strange. Um, so here I have this as a, a shuffle operation here. So you have your 10 terabytes data set. Um, it's broken out into possibly millions of individual training samples. They may be of very you know, different sizes. We'll cover that a little bit later. Um, and you're randomly accessing it. So the common algorithm that you use to train these models is called stochastic gradient descent. The stochastic component means you want to traverse the data set in a random order. Um, this is actually part of the uh, part of why the algorithm works. Um, of course, there are a lot of details there, but this is this is really what people use in practice. There are a lot of alternatives, but this is the thing that people commonly use in practice. So you end up with this um, random traversal of the data set, um, and you end up gathering um, a number of training samples. You process these in parallel. This is one of the main sources of parallelism that you get. This is called data parallelism in machine learning terminology, which is different than the common usage of data parallelism in high performance computing terminology. Um, data parallelism here means that you're running um, the same neural network model over different samples drawn out of your data set. Okay. So internally in the model, because big multi-layer convolutional and recurrent neural networks, um, they involve a lot of dense linear algebra operations. There's a lot of inherent parallelism in those operations. Um, so this is what we call model parallelism. This is parallelism that is inherent in the evaluation of the model. Um, in terms of the workload, you usually have a forward and backward um, operation. So the forward operation evaluates the network. The backward operation uh, computes gradients with respect to the model parameters. Um, they're usually the way that um, these networks are designed. These operations are about equal in terms of the amount of compute performed. Um, they're actually very efficient. Um, if you think about a lot of other problems where you can't compute gradients analytically, it may be much more expensive um, to, to do this type of thing. But with Neural networks, just because of the way that they're constructed, this operation is extremely efficient. Okay, so let's see. So the way that you train your model is um, you traverse your data set in this random order, you gather many batches, you perform forward backward propagation, you compute a gradient, you take a step, um, and then you repeat the process until you've cycled through your data set a number of times. It's really important um, to realize one aspect of this that's that's maybe, that may not really be apparent the first time you look at it, this algorithm is amazingly work efficient. So what do I mean by work efficient? I mean, if you think about all of the different algorithms you could use to modify the weights of a, of a model like this and find a good solution, um, and you think about the amount of computation implied by these different algorithms, this algorithm implies about um, 20 accesses to every point in your data set. So what does that mean? So it means that you kind of look at every example in your data set maybe 10 or 20 times. You do the amount of work implied by the model parameters, which is just you know, linear in the number of parameters in the model. Um, and you can actually find a good solution to many hard problems like vision or speech recognition. It's really amazing that this works as effectively as it does. I'm not going to say anything about why that is. I have no idea why that is. <laughs> um, but it's a really amazing effect. OK. So one thing that people also may not realize here from a computational perspective is that because we're using the stochastic gradient descent, um, we have a sequential dependence between uh, steps or between iterations. Um, this is one of the main difficulties in scaling this type of approach on larger machines, is that really you just run out of parallelism. There's a lot of parallelism in here, but not enough for a giant machine. OK, so given these characteristics, um, the next question is clearly, you know, how do we exploit this parallelism? How do we exploit the characteristics of this workload to get better performance on real systems? So um, I want to start this conversation 
by focusing on the pitfalls because I think that there are a few issues here that aren't really very obvious that people commonly fall into. And you know, as a researcher working in this area, we have to be very mindful of these issues so that we can actually solve a real problem um, that's actually you know, makes progress on accelerating training and not um, just convince or fools us into thinking that we are. So this is the first one. So beware of ignoring work efficiency. So what does this mean? Um, many optimizations may trade um, work efficiency for throughput. So what do I mean by this? If we go back to the previous um, idea of the, how the workload is actually structured, um, you can, it's very easy oftentimes to um, basically get a higher throughput on a machine. So get more parallelism, run at a, run at a higher throughput, um, you know, process your data set faster, but at the same time increase the total amount of work that you have to do in order to reach the same result. So this is just one effect that I wanted to focus on that's a really common pitfall here. So this is um, the effect of increasing the mini batch size, which is the number of samples that you use to estimate your gradient. Um, as you increase this, to a point it doesn't really matter. The idea is that um, getting a better estimate of the gradient is actually useful to some extent because it reduces noise, but you don't want it to be too big. Um, if you make it too big, like let's imagine we made it comically big, like making it the entire data set size, do you imagine that having a really accurate estimate of a gradient um, would allow you to make very fast progress in a hundred million dimension space? Do you really think that one step, you know, or 20 steps in a hundred million dimension space um, can do as well as millions or billions of smaller steps? Um, so usually this is the effect that you see. You can increase the mini batch size to some point and you um, maintain a constant amount of computational work and after some point, which is problem dependent, it usually increases. Um, and you're trading basically better throughput, more parallelism for doing more work, which actually isn't getting you anywhere. OK. So um, let's see. My, my friend uh, Brian Catanzaro is always, um, always interested or always you know, good at making this point. There's no lower bound on how bad a baseline can be. Okay, so one thing that we're, one common trick that we're doing here is we're looking at all the parallelism available in our application and we're saying, can we spread this out on more machines, right? And if we do this effectively, we can get better scaling or better throughput. If we compare the performance on one machine against the performance on 10 or 100 machines, um, if we're doing a good job, we can usually see increased performance with more, with more computational resources. But this is only true if your baseline is good, if your performance on a single machine is any good at all. And it's sometimes hard to say what is good if you're starting from an implementation that you don't understand very well or you're looking at a result in literature that um, it is reporting something like uh, the time you know, in an absolute sense. Um, it's very hard to say how efficient that implementation actually is. So there's this very nice framework um, at, uh, commonly used at NVIDIA that's called this uh, concept of a speed of light of an algorithm or a speed of light of, um, of hardware. And the idea here is that there's a fundamental limit based on the hardware platform that you have based on the physical assumptions um, that were used to design that hardware platform. Of what is the best possible performance that you can do? And so the point is don't measure yourself against an arbitrary implementation that you have no idea how efficient it is, measure, measure yourself against the best that you can do. So the best that you can do is the theoretical maximum performance um, on the processor that you're running on. So you know, th this cartoon here we're showing, you, know, you can slow down an application arbitrarily by adding in you know, hundreds of layers of abstraction, and it makes it really easy to show good scalability, but this isn't really very useful to anybody. So try to measure yourself against the maximum possible performance possible um, and not any baseline. Just ignore the baselines. Don't even, don't even compare against them, against them. OK. So I wanted to spend some time um, going through a bunch of technologies um, that have been applied to improving performance on this type of workload 
that already work, that are used in practice. I just want to spend some time trying to establish what the state of the art actually is. Okay, so one clear trend is dense uh, compute hardware. So there's a clear trend towards building the highest throughput processors possible, which are currently, um, currently GPUs, although I hate using the word GPU because they're really just parallel processors. There are a lot of other parallel processors that are very efficient that aren't called GPUs. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna stick with GPUs right now because maybe it's a common terminology, but really just densest, highest throughput parallel processor that you can think of. Um, so the concept of density is extending to the node architecture. So this is showing two node configurations that we use at Baidu. Um, one is a dual CPU configuration. Um, we use a four-way PCI switch. Each switch hosts four GPUs. Um, so these are all in one 4U box. This puts it at about a three, three kilowatt box. Um, we, also have a, we also have an even denser machine um, where this really just pushes the limits of, of physical integration. We have 16 GPUs in one 4U box. This is more like a five, six kilowatt box. Um, there's a clear trend in here, which is kind of interesting, which is we end up just spending all of our resources, all of our money on GPUs. And we're basically just using the CPU here to run a driver and to access the data set and orchestrate the network communications. Um, but the reason why we're doing all of this is there's a realization that data movement is expensive. The further you have to move data physically, the more energy you have to pay to do that. So we're trying to put um, the densest possible processors as close together as possible. So this is a clear trend. All right, another um, clear trend is to focus on fast, tightly coupled um, network interfaces, fast interconnects. So this is something that's already a clear trend in high performance computing. If you look at how um, modern internet data centers are configured, this is not how they're configured at all. Um, there are some you know, cost issues associated with this, like how much money do you really wanna spend on your network? Um, there's also technology and, and software stack um, issues here. Um, but for deep learning, because we actually, th there's actually this huge benefit of having dense compute. Um, in order to, ex to expand beyond what you can fit into a single box, you have to worry about the interconnect. Um, and so we have, to, we have to spend a lot of resources using, using fast interconnects. Um, so we would use something like um, 50 to 100 gigabit per second um, InfiniBand or Ethernet links between boxes. Um, we'd also use MPI. So why do we use MPI um, rather than you know, some more flexible uh, communication protocol? Um, MPI is just really well optimized on these types of hardware platforms. It's actually hard to get the maximum bandwidth possible out of an interconnect with just off the shelf software. If you try just running, you know, even something like IP over InfiniBand, you typically see, you know, 2x or more slowdown. Um, layering on more levels of abstraction typically reduces performance at these speeds as well. Um, we, we use MPI really not, um, not for any other reason than the software is well optimized for high performance on these interconnects. Um, also, the characteristics of these workloads are a little bit different than what you would normally use um, MPI for. So MPI um, is very highly optimized around um, small messages, so a lot, it's really sensitive to latency. There's this concept in high performance computer, computing called strong scaling. We really care about the latency. Units of work get small, um, and so they finish quickly. And so you, if you take too long in terms of latency in your interconnect, um, you can end up being limited by that. And so there's a lot of optimizations around latency reduction. Those are actually not the right thing to do um, for deep learning training. We have giant models. A common operation that we do with our giant models is that we synchronize them over a lot of different machines. This is just a lot of parallel bandwidth intensive data transfer going on here. Um, and so the default algorithms that um, MPI uses for uh, exchanging data in an operation called an all reduce um, are tuned for latency and not bandwidth. So there are algorithms like ring algorithms um, that are more uh, work efficient in terms of the total amount of data that they send over the network. 
Um, and so by moving to these algorithms, we can see very significant um, speed ups. So fast interconnects uh, care a lot about uh, the total amount of data moved over the network. Um, this is a clear trend as well. Go ahead. So how many times like fault tolerance do you periodically check for? Yes, we period yeah, fault tolerance here. Um, it's a really good question. I'll get I'll get into it a little bit in more more detail in a minute, but um, yeah, the, the state of the art is checkpointing. Um, models run for weeks. You know, they're so so the overhead of checkpointing somewhat infrequently isn't too bad. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit. There's a really weird effect that comes in here that's based on um, the robustness of these models to, um, to small errors. These models are actually very robust to small errors. So we'll get into that in a minute. Go ahead. For the GPU themselves, the fact that we're in the PCI trees and the previous one? Yes. Well, have you considered some sort of direct node to node link with RDNA? Um, let's see. So, in terms of off the shelf hardware that you can buy easily, um, it's hard to get direct direct links. You can, you can do RDMA typically um, over PCI switches. Um, it turns out that we're actually, you know, it, with this kind of effect, we're in a more um, bandwidth sensitive regime than a latency sensitive regime. RDMA really helps you a lot more in a latency sensitive regime. Um, so it hasn't become uh, too much of an issue yet. I feel like going forward, there are huge advantages in terms of um, being able to build higher bandwidth interconnects and reducing the energy consumption in interconnects uh, from tighter integration and more direct links. Um, really, I view this as being a problem um, just with the hardware technology, because this hasn't people haven't been aware of the need for faster and lower um, or higher bandwidth interconnects. People haven't built these these links yet. Yeah, so right now, in these schemes, if the GPUs want to shuffle data across, they have to go back up the PCI tree and come back down up to the nearest level, essentially. Yes, that's true. Um, so different, yeah. I, I would say the most common uh, data access pattern right now is this ring algorithm. So you end up having uh, GPUs communicating with their nearest neighbor, sending like very large data transfers, very bandwidth sensitive data transfers over individual links. Um, so you can orchestrate it over a tree like this. Clearly, if you have a tree, we're not, you know, this isn't um, the most efficient use of all of our routing resources. But you just go up to your nearest PCI switch and come back. Okay, that's that's, that's what you ideally want right. to do. It's it, one thing that's very important is keeping in mind uh, the placement of individual GPUs. So to worry about the physical placement, not just the logical placement. Um, so if you're doing one of these uh, ring algorithms, you do not want to be, for example, um, hopping all the way across uh, your system uh, when, when pairs of nodes are communicating. So it's very important to have um, some information about the physical topology of your network and to really understand for the system that you're running on what is the physical network topology. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so, right. So one solution to um, basically reducing the amount of, or improving the amount of time it takes to, to do these data exchanges between models, mainly for data parallelism, um, is just building faster interconnects using um, reduction algorithms that are highly optimized. Um, there are other approaches also that work um, at the algorithmic level um, that try and reduce the total amount of communication. Um, so for systems with weak interconnects or less well-optimized interconnects, um, it's more common for this to be a problem and for these techniques to apply. So there's three main um, sets of techniques that are used here. Uh, one is called asynchronous uh, stochastic gradient descent. One is called butterfly mixing or butterfly SGD. Um, and one is called uh, sparse or quantized SGD. So I can kind of go through these. Um, they all kind of work uh, to reduce the bandwidth requirements. They all, they all introduce some kind of concept of a delay or some kind of concept of using stale information. Um, and so because of this, from an optimization perspective, they're always less efficient. Um, the hope is, is that the trade-off is worth it, that you can you know, be a little bit less efficient. Your stale information is not hurting you too much. 
Um, and the benefit that you get in terms of latency tolerance or bandwidth reduction um, gives you a large enough speed up on your whole system that you can overcome that, that uh, reduced efficiency. So asynchronous SGD is the most common implementation here. I want to make one point about this that I don't think is really well known. Um, asynchronous SGD is popular probably because it's very easy to implement. Um, it's, it's easy to implement because you can just imagine taking a bunch of nodes, they're all trading models simultaneously. Um, you can take synchronous communication and just say, well, send it asynchronously. So the receivers will receive it, they'll apply the updates whenever they get it. Um, and that gives you a bunch of really nice effects, actually. So you do um, synchronization less often. So this reduces the total amount of bandwidth you need. Um, it also gives you uh, latency tolerance. So your updates can be delayed. You might um, see an update multiple iterations later. Um, this, is, this gives you more latency tolerance. Um, you also get a nice effect of load balancing. So if everybody is sending data to one bottleneck, um, the, the network protocols will naturally apply back pressure. The rate will be slowed down. Um, and if one, and let's say for example, if one model is sending a lot more data uh, to a synchronization point or to a centralized server, um, and another one is sending much less, you get some kind of natural balance of the bandwidth. Um, the one that's sending a lot of data, it may just uh, take longer for that data to actually be sent, so then it might send it at a less frequency. And so you get a natural um, load balancing effect. Um, the biggest problem with all of this is that you get non-determinism. So the way I like to describe this is that imagine that you have a knob on your network and the knob controls the clock speed of your network, of all of your network links. So if I, you know, as a um, malicious person can go over and just turn that knob while your algorithm is running and I increase the clock speed, maybe your model is working just fine. But now I can go and turn it the other way, and I can dial down the clock speed. And you, as a user, is like looking at your algorithm, um, watching your training curve go down, hopefully um, converging to a better solution. As I turn down the clock speed low enough, um, my network can now stop converging. I can now get errors in my network. Um, and so with real systems where um, Interconnect performance is very non-deterministic. You have dyna dynamic clock frequency scaling going on. Um, you have congestion. You might have other applications running on your network. Um, this effect here is really dangerous for reproducibility and for debugging. So imagine you have a model, and you ran for a month, and it achieved a wonderful result. And now you want to reproduce it, and you want to tweak it in some way or you want to design an experiment where you say, what happens if I add 10% more data and I run the same experiment? Because of the dynamic conditions of my network, I might end up with a worse result. This might lead me to a false conclusion. Similarly, if my network crashes for a real software bug or a numerical precision error, um, and I try and restart it to try and reproduce this error, I may never see it again because my training is now non-deterministic. So my main point here is just that you can have everything good here with removing all of the bad things here. You can just add delays and um, synchronize less frequently and do explicit load balancing. And you can get all of the same effects with a purely deterministic algorithm. There's no reason not to do this other than just writing the code. OK. So let's see. So I'm just going to continue on through um, a bunch of these different uh, optimizations and different uh, technologies used in practice. So I want to mention one thing about optimized kernels. Um, part of the really nice um, effect of GPUs, or the really nice programming environment around GPUs, is that they actually are programmable. You can actually get in and edit the source code of individual algorithmic building blocks. So I can go rewrite my matrix multiply code or my convolution code. And I can uh, swap out better algorithms if I find them. So um, using uh, FFT methods, using uh, Winograd methods for convolutions uh, result in better work efficiency for convolutions. Um, so there's been uh, a, a significant amount of work that's gone into this area that's actually uh, made the building blocks um, that the higher level networks will run on more efficient. Um, so persistent RNNs are another example of this. This is some work that we did at, at Baidu. 
Um, the main idea here is just to realize that um, weights in recurrent neural networks are constant over multiple time steps. Um, a straightforward way of implementing this, and the most common way of implementing this, is just using matrix multiply operations. Um, but those operations don't exploit the fact that weights are constant. So if you actually realize that, you can write a custom matrix multiply implementation that caches individual tiles throughout the memory hierarchy of a GPU and avoid the main cost, which is loading the weights over and over and over again. Okay. Um, my figure got really shrunk. Oh well. Um, okay, so I, I want to. So there were some questions before about the um, I/O requirements of these systems. Um, so I wanted to take just a, a moment to talk about them uh, kind of more explicitly. So this is the requirement for the deep speech system, um, and this is kind of maybe a simplistic way of characterizing the I/O requirement. Um, we basically need for every 25 teraflops sustained, which is maybe what we get on eight GPUs. We need about 100 megabytes per second of random um, 16 kilobyte to one megabyte accesses. There's a distribution it's kind of kind of normal um, over uh, between a minimum value of 16 kilobytes and a maximum value of about one megabyte. Um, so this is tough for a, a spinning disk to keep up with. <laughs> um, and, and over a very large machine, so over something like 30 or 40 compute nodes, each with eight GPUs or 16 GPUs in them, it actually adds up to be a very significant amount of bandwidth, and it's random access bandwidth. The data set size is also not tiny. It's terabytes. So we essentially built a uh, 40 terabyte I.O. node um, that connects over InfiniBand. It delivers about six gigabytes per second of 64K random reads. Um, as far as I know, there aren't off-the-shelf uh, file systems or I.O. systems that can sustain these rates. Um, if we were to add more nodes here, or if we were to significantly bump up the performance of individual nodes, this would become an even bigger problem. We'd need even bigger uh, total, total memory or total um, I.O. capacity and even more random access bandwidth. So it's not killing us yet, but it's right on the edge. Just so I understand the problem there. This is when you're building these mini batches, right? That's yes. the primary data. And so if you just rated the shit out of it, if you just had all your yourself, your data across a large number of disks, then you could pipeline that and avoid the problem and scale up as long as you keep the total amount of data per disk constant. Yes. You could just keep scaling that and that would always work. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. I think that's I think that's definitely right. I think but that's it, not what you're doing here. I, mean, I just didn't follow. It's not what we're doing here. I think for a few reasons. Um, part of it might have just been legacy. Like maybe the right solution here is just to buy a big luster cluster or a big GPFS cluster. Um, usually, when we've priced these things out, if we actually buy the amount of bandwidth and the amount of um, I/O performance that we need, it ends up being multiple factors on top of the com the cost of the compute nodes. So we might spend maybe a million dollars or something for these compute nodes. It might cost us $10 million or $20 million to get a file system. Maybe that's a solvable problem. I'm not, I'm not sure. Why not uh, store the, the training data locally on the nodes, on the compute nodes? So that's an option. I think it becomes, it's more viable with small data sets. Right? So if you have a data set that's much smaller than you know, 40 terabytes, then maybe you're fine if you're around one terabyte or five terabytes, something like that. Um, but you have this effect where as you get more compute, you really want to have to access more data. Um, so why not just uh, have a subset of the data on each compute node and then arrange the mini batches such that uh, the compute nodes are only pulling samples from data that they have locally? Right, so I think they're just software problems with doing that because imagine, um, let's see, imagine that you're not always using the whole cluster. Like imagine that you have jobs of different sizes and shapes running on this cluster. Um, it's very hard to think about a replication pattern that satisfies all of those constraints other than replicating everything everywhere. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, source as essentially a file system. 
Oh, if the data source is a, as a like file system. You said you said cluster, you said UTFS. Um, you can build very fast block I.O. systems, which sort of do more lower level I.O. Uh, if you could store your data in a repository that wasn't a file system, have you looked at that? Right, okay. So, um, so the question, I guess, is why do we store with a file system, maybe with a POSIX interface, rather than some more specialized storage, like a key value store or a block store? Um, uh, we've definitely looked at that. I, I think the, the explanation here was really more of um, really, it was just an example. I, 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 the system that we're actually using is a custom system that doesn't, uh, that doesn't have present a POSIX interface. We actually do have a block-based interface. Okay. All right. So that's kind of what people are doing today. Um, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about things that are just, to me at least, and probably to, to other people working in this area, these are clear improvements that will obviously work and nobody has implemented them yet. So these are the low hanging fruit. <laughs> All right, this is a really big one. Um, this is uh, memory efficient backpropagation. There is a paper um, by Alex Graves and others um, from, from Google about this. But really, so the, the main idea here is that uh, there's actually a lot of memory that goes into backpropagation, storing activations for backpropagation. The common way that people implement this is imagine that this line, um, hopefully you can see the mouse, yes, all right. So imagine that this line uh, is the forward propagation of the network, and each of these individual smaller solid lines here uh, represent evaluation of individual operations or individual layers. Um, you kind of walk all the way from the very beginning, the inputs of the network, all the way to the end. And inter at the intermediate points, these solid lines, you save uh, all of the, the activations or all of the, um, at the edges in the network that cross from one layer into the next. Um, then on back propagation, you go, uh, you go the other way, you do the reverse operation, and you use this memory that's stored, um, and it's actually uh, essential for computing gradients. Um, so this is how you, you usually uh, perform this operation. Um, this, okay, so there's, there's an observation here, which is that uh, you don't actually have to store any of this. Um, you can recompute it, um, and so you can trade the memory storage uh, that you're using to save these activations against uh, extra computation being done. And there's you know, many different ways, many different possible schedules of doing this. If, it's, if you have a fixed uh, network architecture and you have a fixed memory budget, there's probably an optimal solution to this problem um, that you can set up and solve for explicitly. Um, there's a really clever heuristic that does it in a divide and conquer way that essentially gives you, um, it's basically, it's basically 30% more compute for logarithmic uh, storage of the activations. So it's a very simple algorithm. Uh, you could apply it to any network. This was originally proposed for backpropagation through time, mainly because backpropagation through time kind of unrolls a network over many time steps. And if you have a lot of time steps, this uh, line here can get really long, and you can just end up saving a lot of memory. And so it's clear that you could do it there um, and it would be beneficial there. But really, this applies to arbitrary graphs. Think of your neural network unrolled over time as a um, directed acyclic, acyclic computation graph. This technique can apply to um, any kind of computation graph. So just take the critical path, imagine it as a line, divide and conquer, um, and you end up with a logarithmic requirement for memory rather than ON. So it's a huge benefit if you have 100 layers or you have 1,000 time steps. So frameworks don't implement this yet. They really should. Do you think this gives you the same answer? As an optimal solution? Uh, uh, that the right efficient back prop gives you the same answer as the normal. Yeah, it will give you the same answer, assu assuming that um, all of the operations are deterministic. So you're trading uh, computer uh, operations with memory I.O. operations. Uh, which, which way are you going on the trade-off? OK, so the idea, so, we're tra so the question is, are we trading um, compute operations for memory operations? 
Uh, to some extent, that's true. What's more important, actually, is that we're trading compute operations for memory capacity. So the memory capacity, especially in high-speed memories, like the GPU, um, GDDR memories, or high bandwidth memories, is pretty small, actually. So it's easy to be constrained not by the total amount of compute that you have, but by the total amount of memory required to store your model. So here, we're doing more compute to need less memory. OK. All right, this is one. Um, all right, so I've got maybe one or two more of these here. Uh, just in terms of uh, timing, is it 5.30 or? 8 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> the camera stops at some point. So the camera stops, but if you're not here. OK, we can okay. just go. The camera stops at 5.45. Yeah. All right, perfect. OK. So um, all right, so this was memory efficient backpropagation. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is model parallelism. Um, model parallelism is basically taking your big uh, neural network and realizing that there's a lot of parallelism in the individual operations that make up the network. Um, this graph on, uh, on, on this side is trying to show you um, the performance characteristics in terms of the basic performance characteristics of different levels of the memory hierarchy of a machine that you could build today. So the lowest level is a thread. We can work up to an SM or a core. You can have an entire processor, an entire GPU. You can look at the node level, and you can look at the rack level. Um, for each of these, you have a different total amount of compute. You have a different total amount of memory capacity. And then you have different uh, bandwidth and latencies to these different, um, these different levels. So an interesting aspect of this that's already taken advantage of by the fact that people run models on one GPU at a time is that you need a certain size of a model. Um, this is different depending on different types of models. So I made a simplifying assumption here that we're just using fully connected layers or recurrent neural network layers. Um, for a convolution, these numbers wouldn't be right. But this is just to kind of give you some intuition. Um, basically, the idea here is on the other side of the figure, you see these, um, these blocks. So these represent uh, dense 2D matrices, kind of an approximation of a neural network layer. Um, at the lowest level, you would need only an 8 by 8 matrix to saturate a single thread, to get full utilization out of a thread. As you move up the memory hierarchy, you need bigger and bigger layers to fully utilize the machine. There are, this is taking into account all of these constraints. Real systems would have even more constraints than this, but this simplified model goes a long way. It's very, it's very easy to figure out what these sizes would be with a simplified model like this, and they're not too far off. OK, so by the time you get to a GPU level, you might need 500 wide layers or 500 unit layers. Um, at a single node level, you might need 2,000 wide layers. Um, at a rack level, you might need um, almost 10,000 uh, sized layers. Um, the interesting thing here is really that um, people kind of go up to the size of a network that fits on a GPU, and then they stop. Um, part of this is because they don't have good software support for this. In order to spread out your computation even further, you have to think about breaking up individual linear algebra operations over multiple nodes. And writing, you know, people for the longest time have struggled with the problem of writing maintainable software that does that. But from a technical perspective and from a performance perspective, it should just work. And when we've built implementations of this, it does work. You do get good utilization. Um, the question here is really just how do you get maintainable software that's portable from one system to another that has this ability. So I feel like there's a lot of low-hanging fruit here. Um, if existing frameworks can solve the software engineering problem, um, there's a clear <coughs> path towards getting good utilization out of much larger machines by running larger models. I'm confused. On the right-hand side, those different sizes, are those limited by memory? Are those limited by the processor? Um, is, that, is that a okay. connection to the memory? Let's see. So to some extent, you're limited by everything. Right. Um, <laughs> those numbers, you, you've got specific Right. So there. these are um, the primary limitation. Uh, so we're using all of these aspects here in the performance model to come up with these numbers. The primary limitations um, are the memory bandwidth and something called um, the amount of reuse. 
So for each byte of memory, um, or sorry, for yeah, for each byte of memory uh, that we load from whatever the highest level memory is that needs to fit, uh, like maybe an 8,000 by 8,000 matrix, um, how many times do we, or how many math operations do we perform on it? So different machines, yeah, it, it's, it's really all of these together. I think this model, this is referred to as the multi-bulk synchronous parallel model, um, is trying to drill down all the complexities involved in this into four numbers for each level of the memory hierarchy. It makes it tractable to do this kind of with pen and paper. Um, but it's in reality, the, the, you know, there are a lot of other things that go into this. Go ahead. Ten nodes per rack. When I was wondering why there isn't ten times as much memory bandwidth in a whole rack than a single node. Uh, so within a node, you're using PCI, and between nodes, you're using InfiniBand or Ethernet, and there's just a difference in bandwidth between those. Go ahead. Six top post one oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm. I'm Sorry about that. That's definitely a typo on the slide. Um, I'll fix that. So these should be nanoseconds. Yeah. Much better. Okay. Yes. <laughs> that would be frightening. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Uh, is that two, two gigaflops per thread that's actually useful? Well, Computation you can do for thread. That's um, I mean, it's not just like a clock rate times the number and structures per cycle. Okay, the, these are all theoretical peaks. Um, on this per, on this processor, you can get eighty to ninety percent of it. Okay. All right. So this is model parallelism. Um, if you had a bigger model, you could run on a lot bigger machine. There's one thing that I didn't really mention at the very beginning that's relevant here is that as you get more data, as you have a, a larger data set, you typically also need a larger model to absorb it. Um, the relationship between these is somewhat complicated, um, but you do generally have this kind of effect. There is an advantage of using bigger models. Yeah, I guess I was going to ask something along those lines. If, you, if your model isn't that large, I mean, do you, can, you, can, you parallel, can you still parallelize up? If your model isn't that large, can you still uh, use a machine like this? Um, you may be able to, but you probably have to rely primarily on data parallelism. And as we saw earlier, there's a limit to that as well. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. So there's another clear trend, I think, towards a lower precision um, arithmetic. So. This, this graph is maybe a little bit hard to read here, but the, the main point is uh, we start from a uh, Titan X GPU um, as a baseline, and all of the points in this graph represent uh, different types of models. So these are different types of speech recognition models. So from a theoretical perspective, um, we look at the expected performance of those models um, on different GPUs. One uh, graph here represents a different, each graph represents a different GPU. Um, and so the, the main idea is that over and to the right, right, so like moving over and moving to the right is better performance. Um, so we look at multiple changes that we could make to a GPU. And we're trying to say here, given all the things we could do to our computer system, what change would be the most important or what would, be, what would improve performance the most? So we look at moving from 32-bit floating point to 16-bit floating point increasing the memory bandwidth from about 300 gigabytes to se a second to one terabyte per second, um, doubling the number of cores, doubling the on-chip uh, memory, and reducing the off-chip memory latency by, by uh, cutting it in half. OK, so the takeaway from this is pretty much everything helps. Um, memory bandwidth helps the least. Um, moving to lower precision helps the most. The reason for this is you kind of get multiple compounding effects. You get higher throughput in the same power budget. You get um, basically more on-chip memory capacity, effective on-chip memory capacity, because now all of your weights take less memory to store. And uh, they also take less um, interconnect bandwidth to move around your processor. Go ahead. How much can you, you turn that up? Can I go to like four bits? So here is the other side of it. <laughs> However, 
low precision training is hard. Um, so this is uh, trying to show um, just some experiments that we've that we've done at, at Baidu on our speech recognition models training in in 16-bit precision. Um, so the blue curve here is a training curve uh, using single precision of a of a good highly optimized model. Um, the red and the green version are um, half precision with no other modifications than just taking every single data structure in the whole network and converting it into half precision. Um, and uh, the orange the orange graph here is basically Sometimes, like looking at each um, each data structure individually on a case by case basis, flipping some of them over to 16-bit. Um, also, uh, when we do math operations, like when we're doing convolutions or matrix multiply operations, we use mixed precision. So we actually there's actually an effect that we see where um, if you use uh, low precision everywhere, you get these large um, accumulated errors. Um, and so we want to do most of the math in low precision and then accumulate into higher precision um, in order to not have these errors become significant over time. So yes, you can usually get it to work. Um, we, can, we can push it lower, although it's hard for us to do these experiments because to push to lower precision, we have to emulate it. And it's really slow to do these experiments. Um, but usually the process is you start by flipping everything and then you know, 10 things break in different ways and you have to diagnose them one by one. Um, eventually, we get to a point where we do the vast majority of the math in, in low precision. Can you, train, can you train precision for the size of the model? At all? So can we trade precision for the size of the model? Um, I don't think that we've really done that kind of experiment in a lot of detail. I think there's definitely an opportunity for more work in this area, maybe. Sure. Does the increased error actually uh, help in reducing the overtraining? Okay. Does the does the error um, help for regularization? So uh, the solid lines here um, are the training error, and the um, the dash lines are the validation error. Um, the reason why there's a gap between them often is because we add in noise, so the training error looks worse than it actually is. Um, so you can see that. Uh, you know, maybe to some extent, like actually, if you look at the blue and the orange curve here, where one is mixed precision, one is single precision, the orange uh, validation error is actually slightly better. It's hard for me to trust a difference that small, um, but I think it's possible that you would see a regularization effect. There's a number of other papers on this on quantized training and on a paper called dense sparse dense training um, that I think shows an effect like this. Do you ever try to match? Okay, so uh, it's important to uh, just stay, say what our perspective is on regularization. Um, regularization is much more important in a small data regime. So in the regime that we're in, where we basically have infinite data, it's not nearly as important. Right? Regularization in the limit doesn't matter if you look at every sample only once. So um, if you have a problem, like if you have a small data set, perhaps that would be very helpful to do this. We don't have a lot of experience or experimental results here because we're not really operating in that regime. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. So this is this is something. So I've given this talk at a bunch of places. This is the part of the uh, the talk that I usually give to um, people who build hardware because commonly the most important missing piece of hardware is the software. <laughs> um, and it's really important to be able to actually uh, use these, like, it's really important if we want to use, like, a new hardware with really great performance characteristics and there's no software and your hardware is basically some complicated data flow, mul you know, hugely parallel, fine-grained, synchronous um, thing that maybe has great theoretical performance, um, you know, it would probably take us months or years to write efficient convolutions, uh, efficient uh, linear algebra operations for these things. So there's a huge amount of effort involved in that. And actually, if you think about it, the API surface for deep learning is actually pretty narrow. You think of things that are narrow, like um, database operations, like um, SQL as being like a really narrow interface 
and it's really valuable as a narrow interface because people don't have to implement too many different things. You don't need general purpose C Python level um, programming interface to run these algorithms. You really just need Blast, Convolutions, malloc, and memcopy. Right? It's a really small interface. Um, so NVIDIA did a really great job of actually just coming out with libraries that work well and are highly optimized for these things. But it's amazing that these libraries are missing on a lot of popular hardware platforms. Yeah. So however you implement them, it's fine. Just that's the interface that, that we use for these applications. All right, so the last part of the talk, I want to spend a few minutes um, talking about some open research problems. Um, these are things, given the problem setup, given there's a clear value in improving performance, um, what are directions that we can go in uh, to try and that might be promising? Okay, clearly faster processors would help. Um, <laughs> I think there are a lot of people already working on this, but I think there's an important um, aspect of deep learning where because we have this um, power law effect going on with data set size and we are compute limited, we don't just want 2x better performance or 4x better performance. We want 1,000x better. We want it to be much, much better than it currently is. So it might actually cause us to fundamentally think about um, what are the limits given current technology. If we just went, started from a clean slate, what's the best that we could possibly do? You know, I've talked to um, a bunch of people about this. I know um, Bill Daly in particular doesn't think that there's more than a, than a 2x uh, improvement over GPUs, and maybe he's right about that. Um, but I think it would be interesting to consider this. And I think it's also important um, to think further into the future. If we do have, um, there may be questions of like, well, we need, like if you're building computer hardware and you're saying, you know, are computers really fast enough? Is my laptop really fast enough? Is my cell phone really fast enough? Is my cluster really fa already fast enough? Maybe it is for a lot of applications, but it's not for deep learning. So let's see how far we can really go. Can we actually get to five nanometers? Can we actually push further than that? How far does 3D integration take us? There's a clear advantage here. These things have really great, deep neural networks have really great um, advantages in terms of uh, the efficiency of the computational building blocks. It's hard to think of something more efficient than a convolution from a computational perspective in terms of how much data you actually need to move, how much state you actually need to move around a processor. Maybe we actually could build um, a very tightly integrated 3D stacked processor um, with very, very low energy um, implementing convolutions. Okay. So there's this interesting effect. Um, so, that, so that was faster processors. Could we train networks with a sparse representation? We use dense linear algebra for everything. That's the state of the art. Could we switch to a sparse representation? It'd be clear that that would reduce the total amount of work that we would do. But can we actually get this to work in practice? So you might think that this is um, promising because of uh, work that's been done um, on Taking dense or tr taking models that were trained in a dense fashion, um, and then applying pruning or quantization uh, to reduce them down into a sparse representation. This has been done successfully after the model has already been trained. So you get basically no performance loss in terms of accuracy for something like a 10 to 100 times reduction in the total amount of computational work that you do, moving from a dense to a sparse representation. Could we get this to work for inference? I think to some extent this is a chicken and the egg and, and an egg problem because people um, really don't have a lot of motivation to try getting training to work if hardware and software libraries, hardware implementations and software libraries can't take advantage of it. Most of the time when we actually run sparse implementations um, through existing deep learning frameworks, we emulate it. So it's actually slower than dense training. And it's very hard to actually do these experiments and demonstrate a benefit. Because what you'd really like to do is not run the same size model. You'd really like to run a much bigger model or on a much bigger data set um, and see if you get results from training in a sparse fashion. There's also a lot of options about exactly how you would do this, like how you rematerialize weights. Um, 
you typically, you're thinking of um, looking at the space of all functions represented by, um, represented by uh, a single neural network. Um, and you might think about constraining that in a way where at a given point you might materialize only a certain number of values, but you'd like to have the option of eventually um, representing the entire space of functions. Um, it's not really straightforward to think about how to do that um, with the existing algorithms that people are using. You take a gradient, you get you know, some step size over all parameters. How do you know which ones to materialize and which ones not to? It's not really clear. Um, but there'd be a big advantage if someone figured this out. All right. Um, I think there's, so there's also this clear limit that we ran into previously. It's different for different problems. But we ran into this limit of we increase the amount of data parallelism. That's one way of scaling to larger machines. But if we do it too much, um, we eventually make our optimization algorithms less efficient. So we converge slower. So it begs the question, are there optimization algorithms that can tolerate more data parallelism, more than SGD? I think there are some experimental results that indicate that there might be. So there's an interesting effect that people have observed where when you're trading a model, you can typically increase the batch size um, over time without impacting work efficiency. Exactly what that effect looks like um, is, is somewhat hard to measure. It's definitely problem domain specific. But I think um, effects like that where you can clearly observe them um, demonstrate that there might be some um, underlying principle here. Like if there's some way of detecting when it's safe to grow the batch size um, or whether there's some optimization algorithm that really isn't sensitive to this that can average over larger larger data sets and then make better decisions than first order methods. Um, I think there is a possibility for this, but no one's really demonstrated this yet either. All right. So there's also the other side of it, uh, which is take the existing algorithms. They're already amazingly work efficient. Let's make them even more efficient. Um, so there is a a th there may be three common trends here uh, that have shown promise on small scale and might scale up to much larger problems. Um, so one is hard mining. Hard mining is basically looking at your data set and taking this realization that some things, um, especially towards the end of training, you're typically just nailing some examples, like some speech, rec maybe in speech recognition, some utterances are just really easy, or maybe in vision, a vision problem, like maybe pictures of cars are just really easy and you're having a really hard time distinguishing between different breeds of dogs. So you can measure the difficulty when you're training of individual samples. And as you get better at some of your data set, you can shift your focus towards the things that are um, actually harder for you. Um, so this is hard mining. Um, curriculum learning tries to do something similar, but isn't really very dynamic. Um, you kind of look at the problem as a person um, or using some kind of other method other than the network, and you try and grade examples so you don't want to start the network with really difficult problems because it probably won't be able to find a good solution randomly. Start with very easy problems and work up to harder problems. Um, and active learning basically applies the same thing uh, to, let's see, the same kinds of effects um, to unsupervised data. So imagine that you have this large unlabeled training set um, you'd let, you can easily do passes of a train model over your um, large, unsupervised, unlabeled training, training set. Um, you can use a model to basically mine through the large data set and tell you which examples are the most promising to label and to add into your data set next. So if you have a fixed computational budget, you can, over time, iterate through this multiple times and improve the quality of your training sets, and make your learning more efficient. All right. So, Pretty much uh, getting to the end here. Hopefully, um, hopefully I've uh, talked about or convinced you that there's a lot of promise in improving performance for deep learning algorithms, um, that we have a lot of tools, we have a lot of directions that we can go to make progress here. Um, so I want to leave with a challenge. So I've, I'm not entirely sure if this is going to work. Um, so I tried to, at some point, sit down and say, for the data sets that we have and my understanding of technology scaling and computer architecture, what is the best case scenario 
like absolutely everything perfectly aligns. We invent wonderful new technologies. Technology scaling goes down to like half of a nanometer. Um, what is the best possible performance that we could hope to achieve? So my, my feeling was that it was around 20 petaflops, 32 terabytes of RAM at 300 terabytes per second in 300 watts. This sounds absolutely insane, but deep learning is an application that could use this. So I want to issue a challenge to people here to try and build this system. <laughs> well, how much? Um, Three hundred dollars, of course. Yes, of course. It has to be cheap. How much is this worth to me? I don't know. I, I think the way I think about this is how much is it worth to solve speech recognition, to solve computer vision, or to solve language understanding? There's no good that comes how from much is that worth to society? Uh, speech recognition. Uh, I'm not a business person. <laughs> just, just tassels. Yeah, not, nothing good. Well, the first thing that consumer will ask is. Is Windows compatible? <laughs> yeah, un unfortunately, I think, um, or fortunately, perhaps, uh, I wouldn't want to think about running an operating system on a machine that was optimized for, for running a neural network. <laughs> that sounds like a way harder problem than this. <laughs> okay. So be happy to take any questions. Um, anybody's interested in uh, asking me more questions about this or contacting me, I'd uh, be happy to answer questions. Um, please come visit us at Baidu if you're interested in learning about more of these topics. Um, this is really just a survey of a few things. We could go a lot more deep into these topics if you're interested. We're de also hiring. Um, <laughs> we definitely need more people to work on these problems. Thank you. Typical deep learning startup is on the, on the challenge side where you have the 300 watts. What drives that? Is that the cost? Yeah. Um, oh, what drives 300 watts? I think it's just keeping the existing um, power power envelope for a single processor constant. Um, I think there are possibly thermal limitations and uh, power supply limitations that might keep you keep you in that. But if if you know. If you can improve performance per watt and you need to break that assumption, go for it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, with your network, uh, I guess I'm coming back to your async GD, uh, G, SGD. The, what's the network utilization? What is, okay, what is the network? So the question is, what is the network utilization like for um, asynchronous SGD? So it really depends on the model. Um, I think for the speech recognition models over about, let's say, 32 to about 128 GPUs, um, it's about, even without using asynchronous SGD, even without using asynchronous SGD, we're somewhere around um, maybe one gigabyte per second uh, per link over all, all, of the, um, all of the PCI links and all of the um, InfiniBand links, somewhere between one and maybe four gigabytes per second. Uh, fully utilized. D does that make sense? Doesn't that mean that you're running a fairly acceptable utilization? When you've got 100 gigabit link, you're running at 25% utilization roughly, and the network running at that utilization doesn't generally, especially with more than incremental updates, is not seeing a huge amount of congestion. So I'm wondering if you could turn your argument against this async approach around and say, well, you're running a reasonable utilization, you're not going to see dramatic effects, and there's not not really going to let somebody come in there and fool with the clock rate. So, you know, it's re reasonably stable, and then if you see non-reproducibility -repro with your model, and you run it in that mode, then there's some instability that you're going to see in practice, because you're taking your training data, you're training this stuff, it's not going to see the same inputs in reality. So if it's unstable there in what you're doing, then it's probably fundamentally unstable the results. I see. So the, the question is, um, imagine in this situation you're not uh, interconnect limited. So if you are using an asynchronous method, you're unlikely to see non-determinism. Um, and so well, in that case, it may not be a problem. Uh, so things break, you know, the thing is really unstable. And if it's unstable, then it's not going to be useful in reality. Right. And um, the errors that are introduced are, I mean, there's already a lot of errors between your, your training and what it sees as input. Very Sure. So one way to think about this perhaps could be that 
Um, the asynchronous methods, they're really only useful if you are at that interconnect limit. For the speech recognition models, we typically don't use them because we're not near that limit. So there's no, maybe there's no harm, but there's also no benefit uh, to using those methods. Um, if you want to introduce sto uh, you know, um, stochasticity into your training, you can do that with random, like explicit sources of random number generation, either in model initialization or training set traversal. Um, so I, I definitely do agree with you that it is a good idea uh, to introduce some amount of randomness into training um, to make sure that the model is robust. Um, let's see. So, but this this uh, statement that um, the speech recognition models are not sensitive to interconnect bandwidth, at least at the scales that we're running them right now, um, this doesn't apply to all models. So language models and translation models in particular are running at the interconnect limit. They're limited by interconnect bandwidth, even given the types of systems that we have. Um, the reason for that is because they're typically unrolled. They're, they're less compute intensive, so they do less computation um, for uh, every sample. Um, so there's a whole range of models. And this is really just a tool. You shouldn't think of it as always wanting to use this, but use it if it's appropriate. All right, so the question is, um, are there differences in network uh, bandwidth utilization over time? Um, so it's generally possible, if you have a model that's very well balanced, right, like a model that, if given the uh, computational throughput, given the network bandwidth, um, then, and they're about equally balanced, it's generally possible to schedule things, although it's difficult, so that they're perfectly overlapped. Um, you never get perfect overlap, but you can get pretty high um, overlap. That being said, it's hard to do that. I think most frameworks don't do this. Um, basically, um, in large layers, uh, there's just a lot of parallelism. So you can think about um, all of the model weights, and especially during backpropagation, um, you can think of backpropagation as exposing some of the weights as being available for um, for synchronization. So you can kind of overlap. If you break things up into fine enough pieces, you can overlap, synchronize these weights, do backpropagation for the next set of weights, and kind of cascade that through the entire network. Um, as long as you can schedule things like that, you have a global visibility into the whole problem, you can usually overlap things well. Um, that being said, if you're unbalanced, right, like for different models, you might have different interconnect to compute ratios. Um, if you swing it very far on one end of the spectrum or another, you'll be limited by one or the other. So you'll swing from, like if you're very compute limited, you'll swing from phases where you're doing just all compute and then a little bit of bandwidth. Or if you're network limited, you'll swing from phases where you're doing all network to just a little bit of compute. Um, if you're not sensitive to these things, like if you're not actually looking at the characteristic of your system, uh, it's very common that you'll just end up in one of those two situations. It's a really, it's an important point actually that there's a big space of models. Um, there's a, and there's a smaller space that works well for a given application, like for speech recognition or vision. There's an even smaller set that runs efficiently on hardware. 